Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. The United States is a government of laws uh, and separations of power. And when a, even if it's an individual district court judge who's making this determination, we've got to go through the process. Blue Monday, how are you? Blue Monday. Another Blue Monday. I got to work, plan to sleep all day. Thanks, Fats. I appreciate it. Give him a pork rib and I'll see him in the casino. Listen, I got to tell you something. Last night I was at dinner. I've been eating too much after the illness, you know, starve a fever, feed a cold and all that. So I figured, all right, it's licensed to eat a lot after I was sick. And I, I, a lot, I, I ate a lot, drank a lot. I couldn't eat, though. I sat down at dinner with a friend, and the first thing I said was, I can't eat. The Islamic State is throwing gay men off roofs head first under the guise of Muslim Sharia law. I said, I can't sit here. I can't take it anymore. There are pictures of them being thrown off a building from, from a Fox News pictures. And you have to look at the pictures to understand what I'm saying to you. ISIS is throwing gay men off roofs in the areas that they capture, for example, in Mosul. And they make hundreds of innocent people watch this happen. The gay men are held by their feet and dropped head first. The Islamic State released a series of horrifying photos showing blindfolded men tossed headfirst off a building because ISIS claimed they were gay. Not one word from the gay lobby in America, not one word from the gay lobby in Europe, not one word from the United Nations, not one word from that lying, thieving, backstabbing, anti-American creature in the White House. I couldn't eat, so I decided to drink before I ate. Then I was able to eat a little bit. Women are being kidnapped and raped. Eight-year-old girls are being kidnapped and sold as slaves and raped by these vermin throwback subhumans. Islamic State subhumans. Not one word from a women's group, a woman's group anywhere on earth. Is it any wonder it's a blue Monday? I mean, you could sit idly by, but you're the type that sat idly by while the Jews were being gassed in the gas chambers. Oh, I know. Why, if they dare do that again, you'd, you'd do what? You'd do nothing. You would do nothing. You're exactly the good German. All of you are the good German. You've done nothing while this is going on. While this Holocaust occurs, you've done nothing. You've enabled Obama. You've enabled Obama, which is why this is happening. All of you liberals are guilty for these rapes and murders because you've enabled Obama. You've enabled a sorority that looks the other way, that is concerned with sexual harassment in the military as opposed to real rape, real kidnapping, and real murder. So it's a blue Monday, all right. But you don't care because you're a good American. And good Americans don't care about such things. And secondly, what do you care about Iraq and gays? You're not Iraqi and you're not gay. So why should you care about that? Let them throw them off the roofs. Is that right? Is that what you want? Well, that's, your, that's what America's become. Indifferent, numb, eight-second attention span. The attention span not of a goldfish but of a gnat. You have the attention span of a Drosophila fly. That's what you have. Have a nice Monday. Let's hear Blue Monday again, and I'll start the show on another note. Now that I got that out of my system, I can go on to the show. Blue Monday, how are you, Blue Monday? Got to work, plan to sleep all day. Here come Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. Welcome to the Savage Nation. What a cheerful Monday we're going to have today. Yes, indeedy. Conveyor radio. Conveyor talk radio. Yes, those Republicans are just dandy and great. And those Democrats are just evil. Now, if we only elected a Republican, why, we'd have a perfect republic all over again. It's just those nasty little Democrats that we have to get out of the way. Yes, indeedy, here we come. Conveyor radio for the radio consumer. What he says in the morning is repeated ten times a day, but not by me. I was reading an article about creativity and psychosis sharing a genetic source. Artistic creativity may share genetic roots with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, according to a study published today. The research published in the journal Nature Neuroscience 
delves into a well-known genetic database, the Decode Library of DNA Codes, derived from samples provided by the population of Iceland. Let me stop right there. I'm sorry, I have nothing against Icelanders, but if I were to study creativity, I would not choose a population of Icelanders. So far as I know, they're not very well known for creativity. They may be fine people. They may know how to ski and whatever they do, they kill musk ox. Of course, musk, musk, musk ox are dead for a long time. Whatever they kill up there, rain there. But why would you study schizophrenia and creativity in Iceland? Who would choose such a population? I know why they choose such a population, because it's a homogeneous population. So the authors looked at 86,000 Icelanders. Listen, if you put me in Iceland, I'd go schizophrenic within a half a year. How could you live there? What is there to do there? I mean, I don't have no idea. Why would anyone live there unless they were born there? So they looked at the genomes of people engaged in artistic work. All right. And these samples came from more than 1,000 volunteers who were members of Iceland's National Societies of Visual Arts, theater, dance, writing, and music. All right, fine. And they found that members of these organizations were 17% likelier than non-members to have the same genetic signature. So what? So what are they proving? What, people who are creative tend to be a little bipolar or a little schizophrenic? And listen to me. I don't understand why this study has any validity whatsoever. We all know that creative people tend to be a little nuts. And we all know that psychotic people tend to be a little creative. And? So what's new about the study? Nothing. I guess they had to send somebody to Iceland uh, with an NSF grant or an NIH grant or something like that. But let me ask you something. If you are a creative person, you know that you're under the pressure of having certain impulses that the people around you have never had. Feelings, sensitivities, intuitions, uh, and things like that. And as opposed to the normal paths, who either never feel these things or suppress them, you as an artist not only don't suppress those feelings, you engage with them. And that's how you can paint. And that's how you can write. That's how you can compose music, right? Is this something you're interested in? I don't really know. I have no idea what people are interested in. I got a letter over the weekend. Savage, it came to me by email from uh, uh, Talker57. That's the group that charts the uh, people who listen to talk radio on uh, streaming radio, where my show is number one with a 25 share. Rush has a 12 share. God bless him. You wouldn't know any of this. You'd think he's number one, but he isn't. In streaming radio, where younger people listen to radio, I'm number one with a monster share of 25. So someone, they can't reach me, so they reach me through that site. It's a short paragraph that's worth listening to. Dr. Savage, I was a POW at age seven along with my family in the Philippines at the start of World War II. The Japanese put every foreign citizen, other than Germans and Italians, into concentration camps. We were in Santo Tomas. After six months, the president, who the Japanese appointed, was a good friend of my father. They were both Masons. He wrote a release for all of us, and we hid in the Philippine jungle for three years. We were protected by the ITAS, a group of mountain people. The group that hit us numbered about 30. Anyway, Savage, they had a cure for just about everything. For instance, their cure for diarrhea was charcoal from coconut shell. It worked for me. Another cure was, again, coconut charcoal and coconut oil for any cut. Again, it worked for me. Unfortunately, these gentle people were ratted out by a M-A-C-A-P-I-L-I, Filipinos that joined the Japanese, and the Kempatais, the Japanese Gestapo, came to their village and killed all of these gentle people. The Japanese killed every last one of them. We were across the ridge at the time and witnessed the whole thing. We were protected by another guerrilla group after that. Keep up with your radio program, Dr. Savage. I've been listening to you for three years now. Now, that was in response to my talk about the tribal people using their own medicine for the last hundreds of thousands of years because I was very fortunate to have worked with tribal people in Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Marquesas. I've been on some of the remotest islands in the world before tourism decimated these islands and turned them into extensions of MTV. And so I have a great respect for the technology of so-called primitive people. I'm not selling you anything. I'm not selling you uh, anything at all. I'm just saying that before we sneer at uh, individuals who still live in these remote regions as kind of throwbacks or have no knowledge of the world or how to survive, why don't you consider trying to survive naked and afraid in a jungle and see how long you'd last? 
as I told you, Nat Geo has a show, Naked and Afraid, that I like a lot because you see, you see these very fit people, some of them ex-Army Rangers, some of them uh, Special Forces men, tough as nails. They don't last 10 days. They can't do it. The women are tougher than the men in many cases, not always. But these women who think they're tough as iron crack up and have to be airlifted out as well. And you think about the peoples who've lived on these islands and how they've learned how to live off the land is astonishing. That's technology. And they uh, know that from trial and error over 20,000 years or more. And that's where that came from. That's all. 855 I'm not sure where I'm going to go today. I have some wonderful scholarship applications that I had intended to read. Remember, I'm running a contest which closed on March 31st. It's $100,000 to each of, uh, to five people to get $20,000 each. We had to screen 1,700 applications for an essay on what it means to be an American. And I'm going to read you one of them from a college student so that you have hope, so that you don't think that all of them are drug addicts, pot smokers, transition cases, or, or whatever. They're not all waiting to become uh, a, a sex changer. Many of them love this country and they're willing to fight and die for it, as you'll see soon when I return right here on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. A, a migraine listening to this. Okay, welcome back to the Savage Nation. It's a blue Monday. I don't know what's wrong today. It's horrible. As ISIS throws gays off roofs, gays say nothing in America. They're worried about homophobia in the workplace. As ISIS brutalizes, kidnaps, and rapes women and girls, a silence from feminists. All right, you don't care about that. Clinton donated $100,000 to New York Times group the same year paper endorsed her. What's new about that? The New York Times is what? What, what has it ever been? Is anything anything but a publicity rag for the radical left? No. They take my book. Yeah, I'll make it personal. Countdown to Mecca. It beat four other books in sales for two weeks in a row, and they refused to list it as one of the top 15. What does that tell you? It tells you what you need to know. You're living in a, in a concentration camp of ideas. You know, only the leftist ideas uh, need apply. It's an interesting statement. I was reading over the weekend that liberalism is making a comeback in America, according to a, 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 a survey of 1,000 adults. I love it, 1,000 adults. I don't know any conservative who has ever been approached by a pollster, nor would reply to a pollster. But anyway, a thousand adults. Who are these adults? Where they meet them all? In a, in a club? And they say that uh, people are more accepting of liberal ideas now. They shift on this. Gay marriage, of course, is the number one thing. Day and night brainwashing. Day and night. Like Lenny Reifenstahl, around the clock, gay marriage, 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 sex change, sex change, sex change, sex change. Gay marriage, gay marriage, that's all that's on anyone's mind. It's all that's on their minds, they're psychotic. They're nuts. That's all they care about in a world that's going up in flames with people being raped and murdered and thrown off buildings? Yes, that's all I care about. Your toothbrush may be covered in poop. Let me get scatological. It's an interesting story, but since you're not interested in news today, I can sense it. Is everyone on vacation? It's the 8th of June. So the brats are in school, aren't they? They're in school still? The Ritalin cases are not on vacation again? Every other day, they're running in the streets. And wherever I go, 9 o'clock at night, they're sitting there with a coloring book next to me in a restaurant. I don't go out for fine dining to watch a child with a coloring book. I don't want to see them in there. They should ban them. I don't go to McDonald's with a coloring book. I just love the, the, the 60-year-old father with the ponytail, with the younger wife indulging the child at the d table next to me. I just love it. They give you a history lesson. You're sitting here trying to eat, and they ask him, so, Johnny, who was the 13th president of the United States? And the little parrot repeats it as, as he's coloring a picture of uh, Zimbabwe or something. I, I can't stand it anymore. It's a country gone mad. Your toothbrush may be covered in poop. What's this nonsense? That got nothing better to do? Oh, toothbrushes in communal bathrooms. Well, what do you expect? You mean chill, college students? Toothbrushes of resident students using a bathroom shared by at least nine people 
60% of the toothbrushes were contaminated with fecal matter, regardless of storage method. That's disgusting. That is really sickening. Brushers who have a bathroom to themselves are likely sticking tiny poop molecules into their own mouth. Oh, come on. That's insane. That is really insane. So what are you supposed to do about this? Researchers found no practical method for daily protection from fecal contamination, but recommended that students or other communal bathroom users follow the hygienic tips of the ADA, including, listen to this idiocy, you have to tell a college student, don't share toothbrushes? That, that, you have to tell a college student that? Rinse your toothbrush before and after use? You have to tell the morons that? Wait, what else? And avoid the cross-contamination risks of close quarter storage. In other words, don't lay your toothbrush on your, on your roommate's toothbrush. Stupid. This is insane. Scientists also recommend against using a container or case, which encourages bacterial growth. This is stupid. What if they lost common sense, these idiots? Toothbrushes that are stored upright and open air will dry best. Come on. Nonsense story. Who would share a toothbrush? They share needles now for, for drugs. Why not? Speaking of bacteria, I saw another health-related article. I'm not going to talk about white privilege and how those dangerous degenerates who've trained school districts not to discipline black children because it shows white privilege and it's just a cultural misunderstanding. So they're running amok, beating people up, punching teachers. The schools are out of control. More school districts report chaos after white privilege theory influences discipline rules. Gee, I'm shocked as a former teacher. I'm just shocked. I'm shocked that they gave him a pass. And who gave him this idea? A bunch of perverts from San Francisco. That's who. Anyway, gut check on Parkinson's new findings on bacteria levels. Listen to your gut as common advice when faced with an important decision. Research is now heating his words to gain further insights on how Parkinson's disease. Again, another story that makes no sense. Anyway, it's all about the immune system and not to kill off the good bacteria in your gut. But I have to tell you about it because there are specific bacterial levels affected in Parkinson's disease and free copies of Mecca to everyone who gets on the air. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. I heard it in the movie American uh, Hustle. I missed that movie when it came out, then I saw it on TV in part. I fell in love with the movie. I started watching it. I watched it all over again. It's probably one of the greatest, top 10 great American films ever made. It came and went. I'd rank it as good, if not better, than The Godfather because it captures the ab scam. Remember the ab scam thing in the 70s? Many of you remember it. Many of you know, where the mafia, in cahoots with the FBI, you don't know who's worse, by the way, the gangsters or the FBI, you don't know who's more ruthless and who, who's worse the FBI or the mafia, set up congressmen to bring them down with bribes, and it was caught on tape. The movie is sort of about that, and one of the key players in it. I love that film, but the music was amazing, the music score. And that's why anyone who thinks they're going to make a movie, you know what I love to do is when I watch a movie, I watch the credits at the end, or I go on IMDb, and you look at the full full staff, right? It's like 100 people involved in, in, in picking music, 50 people involved in this, 80 people involved in that. That's why the production is so good. Yeah, I know. You got a camera now. You're a movie maker. Right? You got an iPhone. You, oh, yeah, I'll put it on the internet. It'll go viral. You'll go viral. You make four cents. Everyone's a filmmaker. That's why I never made a movie. You know, there's either you're going to do something really well, but, or don't do it at all. That's why I do radio and nothing else other than write books. That's it. I'm not a filmmaker. And people confuse themselves today because they think because they have a, an iPhone, they're a movie maker. Everyone's Cecil B. DeMille, Cecil B. DeMille and, and Coppola put together. Or pick your favorite uh, director. Speaking of creativity and psychosis, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, I could ask you a loaded question like, do you know creative people who are nuts? Or who doesn't? But why do creative people think they have to act nuts? Some of the most creative people I ever met don't act nuts, by the way. And I was always shocked as a young man when I was trying to be something when I met actually great artists and writers, which were occasionally, they were very straight looking. They generally dressed in a suit and tie. They didn't put their hair in a crazy way or, you know, a nipple ring or whatever. They didn't have to put on an act. It's like the poseurs in the cafes in San Francisco. They're all waiting to be discovered. 
Don't you love the people who sit in ca- cafes with their laptops or whatever they're doing, writing away, and if you come in and talk, they look at you like you're disturbing them. They're working on something, something important, some poetry. They're still living at home and they're 30 years old. They don't have a job. They went to Stanford or some expensive school. It cost the parents 125000 a year. They can't get a job because they're lazy. They have mo- no motivation, but they're sure they're going to write a great film script or a novel. So instead of staying home and working hard, they go and do it in a cafe where everyone can watch them. And then they stare at you if you talk too loud near them, like you're disturbing them in a, in a public cafe. Hemingway knew what they were called. They had a name for them, posures, P-O-S-E-U-R-S. It's a French word. It's never been, a, never been a better word for most people in America today who've never created anything but think they can. Line one, Nicholas, go ahead, please. What's your topic? Uh, yes, hi. Um, well, regarding uh, um, what you were talking about, creativity, I feel that um, it's not necessarily about a person who's um, overly emotional or intuitive. I feel it's, it's um, more within the genetics of the person and the intelligence and intellect along with uh, the consciousness that one has um, um, that other people that don't have. Well, I don't think you're saying anything unique. This article was a study of creative people, and they said that creative, creativity and psychosis share a common genetic source. You know, but I... They said they compared genetic and medical data from 86,000 Icelanders. They established a DNA signature which pointed to a doubled risk for schizophrenia, and an increase of a third for bipolar disorder. But that's not unusual. I mean, most autistic people are edgy, right? What does that mean? I mean, What, know, what does it mean, edgy? The, the thing is to control the edgy, not to go with the edgy. See, here's the people. A lot of creative people ape the creative people. They make believe they're more creative than they are by acting out or aping what they think is a creative person. The thing is to marshal those creative urges and create something with it and control them. Don't you think that's the issue? Well, you know, that's a good point that you made. And, you know, not necessarily every study um, is a legitimate study as well. And, you know, they could purposely take, you know... Right, well, pre- let's not start in with, now you're doing science all of a sudden. Not only are you a Picasso, but now you're, you're already modifying the science study. Are you an artist yourself? Oh, yes, I am. You know, I mean, I... I'm not um, purposely making my life about being an artist, but... I mean, are you a productive artist? Do you make a living at it? No, I don't make a living out of it. I, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I write uh, songs. I, I try to... All right, you see, here's the problem. A lot of people are creative, but they're not good enough to make a living at it. Then they'll say, well, I haven't been discovered yet. That's often not true. That's very rare. And many people have a creative spark in them. In fact, most of us do, incidentally. But that doesn't mean you're an artist. Look at children. I've studied this my whole life. It's something that's, that's I've been interested in since I'm a, a little kid. Because I was always different. I always knew I was different. I didn't know how I was different, but I was different than the other boys. And believe me, I paid the price for it. My own father used to look at me and think that there was something wrong with me because I wasn't like the other kids. And I remember he really put an onus on me, a bad one. He said, you know, he'd look at me when I was three, four years old, five, when I could think. And he'd stare at my eyes. He never understood me because he knew they were very deep and they had a, a certain shine to them. And he was afraid of me. As a typical, let us say, I don't know how to put it without putting him down, an uneducated peasant from Europe with no education and no higher aspirations other than to make a buck and uh, get through life. Truthfully, that's all it was. He was afraid of the child who was creative. And so he ridiculed me constantly. And he'd look at me and he'd say, I don't know. He says, uh, look at you. He says, either you're going to be a genius or a madman. I said, well, that's very nice when you're five to hear that. Who would say that to a son? Who in the, Would you ever say that to a child? You're going to either be a genius or a madman and, ha- and, and repeat it over and over again unless you were trying to hurt the child? So I've had to overcome a lot of obstacles to achieve what I've achieved. And it took me a long time of analyzing what that statement meant to realize he didn't know what he was talking about. He was just trying to run me down because he was afraid of me and intimidated by my creativity and, frankly, the spark of life that was in me. But let's put him aside for a moment. It's a long time ago. He's dead a long time. May rest in peace. I want to make a larger point that's not about me per se, although everything's about me at the end of the day. That's all a talk radio is. It's all about us. It's a talk radio of all the mediums is one of personality. It's personality driven. Anyone could read news stories 
uh, on the Internet. Everyone can talk about news stories from the Internet. All right, fine. Who can't do it themselves today? 20 years ago, you needed a, a talk show host to find the stories for you. You don't need, need them anymore. What do you need them for? You go on the Drudge Report and three other sites and you know the news and you go on with your day. But you need them to tell you their opinion? Fine, maybe you like it. That's fine. But what I'm saying to you is something different. So creativity is the issue. Psychosis is the issue. They're not necessarily intertwined. One is separated from the other. Not cr all creative people don't have to be nuts. And all nutty people don't have to be creative. I mean, we, we all know about the famous Van Gogh painting. I'm sorry, I didn't say Van Gogh. I realize many of you are experts on the pronunciation. And you like the comeback. I had a friend once, an uncreative guy who resented me from top to bottom every time I published a book. So he went to Holland, went to the Van Gogh Museum, and he came back. I said, so how were the Van Gogh paintings? He said, oh, you mean Van Gogh? That schmuck lives in Berkeley. Never amounted to anything. Became a doctor just to get the drugs in the cabinet. That was his idea of creativity, to go to medical school to, to abuse drugs. But nevertheless, Van Gogh. <clears throat> but we're all familiar with the Van Gogh paintings in the madhouse, right? He did go crazy, and okay, that's another story. Now, uh, probably I could have saved him with a high dose of vitamin B1 and possibly, uh, I don't know, magnesium. I probably could have stopped him from the schizophrenic meltdown. There's no question in my mind that a high dose of, of thiamine, niacin, <clears throat> folic acid, magnesium could have stopped the meltdown. But okay, they didn't, they didn't know anything about that then. I have learned through my life that when I get to the edge of my own psyche, when I can't take it anymore, do you ever get there? What do you do? You run, you work out, right? Everyone has their way of coping, right, Robert? Doesn't everyone listening to this show as a human being reach those points? I doubt that there's a so-called ordinary person out there who doesn't reach that point in their own mind. It doesn't matter whether you're a soldier, <coughs> sailor, artist. It doesn't matter what you are. Everybody has limits to their capacity to deal with uh, conflict, pain, loss, so how you cope with it is very interesting. And artists generally cope by creating. You understand that? Now, some artists will actually feed that feeling of they're going to snap. They'll feed it with drugs. They'll feed it uh, in the old days with alcohol. You know, they, it used to be popular for writers to be drunks. Remember that? In the 30s and 40s, they used to joke about being alcoholics. And they would drink themselves silly thinking that they creative more. Who knows? Whatever. I doubt very much. If you look at what you write or paint when you're drunk, what does it look like? Garbage. It requires great control to do anything right. It's like driving a race car. You know, you wouldn't want to drive a race car drunk or, or, or high, would you? So why would you want to drive a paintbrush when you're stoned? Nevertheless, you know, I'm not going to say different strokes for different folks because I'm a strong believer in discipline in art. And I think that only discipline creates great art. I think that undisciplined work creates undisciplined, uh, undisciplined uh, minds create undisciplined work. And I'm not a real fan of the gibberish that comes out of most people's mouths or what they write or what they paint. So th that's my belief. I'm more of a classicist when it comes to art. And so what I'm saying to you is there's a way to control, to control those edgy impulses. When you get there, there are ways to pull yourself back. And everyone has that way of coping. You can run around the block in three minutes. You can do 10 push-ups. You can simply go outside and breathe the air for 10 minutes. And you can take a large dose of B vitamins. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to stop that edginess. The problem is most of us have been taught to take drugs, uh, whether they be, I, I can't name them, they're sedatives, and you become a drug addict. And that doesn't help your creativity. So I think this is a great uh, a topic, and I'm glad that some of you got, got, got interested in it. But this issue of creativity and psychosis, sharing a... Genetic source is kind of silly in a way. I mean, what have they really found in the genome? They look at the genomes of people engaged in artistic work, and they say that there's a DNA signature that's in common, and it shows a doubled risk for schizophrenia and an increase of a third for bipolar disorder. Now, you know, these are very sensitive issues for most of you. I know schizophrenia does exist. But bipolar disorder is not as common as it is uh, said to be, in my opinion. It used to be known as manic depression. Then they changed it to bipolar. And a lot of people use it as an excuse to get disability benefits, to get away with virtual murder at work, to get special privileges in school. You know, oh, my daughter's bipolar. Well, no, she's probably just a troublemaker. You know, and so you want everyone to cater to you because you come up with an illness. 
and many of you get offended when I say things like this, but it's, it's my, my belief system that the, the diagnosis of, of many, many conditions, physical and mental in our society, have been over overdone. And they're, they're overdone for a number of reasons because there's a lot of benefits that go along with the overdiagnosis of certain disorders. I didn't say all, nor, <clears throat> nor did I say that all mental situations or conditions are invented. I didn't say that, so don't misquote me. I know it's easy to do when you're not listening carefully. Uh, but this, this creativity and psychosis issue intrigues me very much. Norman Mailer wrote a great book about 30 years ago called, uh, I think, Genius and Lust. Raise your hands if you still remember that book. If anyone even knows who Norman Mailer is, I mean, he's been forgotten a long time ago. But Genius and Lust was a very interesting book. And it was a, I think it was a, his ode to Henry Miller, incidentally. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. I love this topic, creativity and schizophrenia or mental illness, however you want to put it. I mean, that's not the head of the article, but... It was creativity and psychosis share a genetic source. Okay, fine, but that could trigger a whole discussion. And it'll lead us all down to the dopamine connection between a schizophrenia and creativity. We'll talk about dopamine. Because according to the National Institutes of Mental Health, about 2.5 million American adults have some form of schizophrenia. And that's a disorder which affects perception of reality. That's real. Paranoid, disorganized, catatonic different symptoms, different stages of the illness. And many people fear schizophrenia, and it's real. Schizophrenia symptoms generally appear between the ages of 16 and 30. And they can include auditory hallucinations in which people hear voices in their heads and unrealistic beliefs, such as the possession of superpowers, right? How many of you have that? Many of you think you have superpowers, or you know people who do. And uh, I have no, I knew kids when I was young, who were very sadly schizophrenic. Clearly, they were that way. I don't know why. One kid thought he was Superman. He, I remember to this day, he put on a cape, a Superman costume, and jumped off the, uh, not didn't kill himself, he jumped from the top of the staircase in his little attached house and thought he could fly. Well, or he got hurt. He didn't die. I'm giving an example. There are terrible things that happen to people from, from minds that don't function properly, and you can't laugh at it, obviously. Now, no one knows what causes schizophrenia, but genetics and environmental factors certainly play a role. Now, this article argues that there's a genetic component, which I don't doubt there's a genetic component to anything. But I have to remind you of a very important piece of work for those of you who suffer from these illnesses or this category of illness, who don't have any hope other than to take medication. I'm not telling you to stop taking it. One of the greatest geniuses of our time, who's dead now, was a doctor named Abraham Hoffer, MD, PhD, Canadian by birth. I knew the man personally. I looked up to him greatly. He was a giant in the field of nutrition. He invented, excuse me, he discovered that niacin reduces atherosclerosis the same way that anti-sclerotic drugs work. In other words, Instead of Lipitor, you could use high doses of niacin. And he discovered this in the 1949-1950 era. And he told me personally that he could have patented it and made a fortune, but he decided to give it to mankind. Could you imagine? And it was never patented, so you could buy niacin over the counter, and many of you use it as a, instead of drugs. Okay. But Hoffa worked with schizophrenic patients his whole life. In fact, I believe he uh, had a daughter who was schizophrenic, if I'm not mistaken. And he insisted that he could reverse schizophrenia with mega doses of niacin. Mega doses of niacin reverse schizophrenia. The medical establishment called him a nut, dismissed him for many reasons. They never did double blinded studies anyway. But you could look up Abraham Hoffer, H O F F E R, on schizophrenia for yourself. It may be of some value for you to look into uh, this possibility. And then we'll come back and talk about creativity schizophrenia and all the news that you come to whatever join the savage nation call now 855-400-SAVAGE savage warning the savage nation contains adult language 
Adult content. Psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It's just another manic Monday. Wish it was Sunday. Well, sex is on your mind. It's all it's on anyone's mind, apparently, whether you're in Pakistan or America. Katzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg knows that sex sell, and they keep it in front of your face day and night so you don't focus on the real problems facing the nation, the meltdown of our borders, language, and culture. But let's put them aside for a minute. We're talking about uh, schizophrenia, genius, that kind of thing. Is there a relationship between creativity and psychosis? Well, a new study says there's a common genetic source, and uh, so what? what does that tell us? We know that to be creative, you have to think differently from everyone else. And we know that carriers of genetic factors that predispose to schizophrenia also can predispose to creativity. And I think the challenge for any artist or any creative person is to not go off the rails, in other words, while creating. But there are other effects, uh, other uh, outside elements that affect whether we go off the rails or can create, okay? And we can look at sex itself. How old should a person be as having their first sex? See, that's a big question. What is the age of consent right now? What should it be? Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the most evil, demented people in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court, a woman who has cursed America for all these years on the Supreme Court, a woman who was never qualified to be in the Supreme Court, a woman who had previously been the chief counsel for the ACLU, one of the most dangerous organizations the world has ever seen, has done more damage to America than ISIS. The ACLU has done more damage to America than ISIS. She was the chief counsel, and she, she's been on the Supreme Court for many years now, put there by Republicans, incidentally. The same Republicans who rubber-stamped Ruth Bader Ginsburg, rubber-stamped Loretta Lynch as attorney general. The very same character players, incidentally. So why is she being talked about by me? Because she wants the age of consent, the last I checked, lower to 14 years of age. Well, that's pretty amazing. Everyone knows that younger than uh, a certain age is very harmful to the child. Very harmful. And we live in a society where if a young person has not had sex <clears throat> with, a, with another person, by a certain age they consider themselves, well, something's wrong. So there movies like a 40-year-old virgin, you know, things like that. And you laugh at people who don't have sex. And so a study was done on this very issue of timing of first sex has far-reaching relationship effects. Research looking at how the timing of sexual initiation in adolescence impacts adult romantic ties finds that having sex later may lead to better relationships. Later, not earlier, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg would imply. It says the timing of sexual initiation in adolescence influences romantic outcomes, (coughs) such as whether people get married or live with their partners how many romantic partners they've had, and whether they're satisfied with their relationship later in adulthood. It's an interesting study. So they classify those having an early sexual relationship as younger than 15, an on-time one as 15 to 19, or a late one older than 19, as first experience with sexual intercourse. And they published it in Psychological Science. And as expected, later timing of first sexual experience was associated with higher educational attainment and higher household income in adulthood, when compared with the early and on-time groups. Individuals who had a later first sexual experience were also less likely to be married, and they had fewer romantic partners in adulthood. I don't know what this means, actually. I think half these studies make no sense. But I think it's an interesting point of departure for discussion, which is what age of consent should there be in the United States of America? The fanatics at the ACLU want it lower to 14 or 12 or whatever. Maybe 10 will be the new norm. Maybe in a few more years after Bruce Jenner, uh, it'll be five. We don't know how sick the society can get. It's melting down faster than Chernobyl did. Let's talk about these topics, would you please? The phone number is 855-407-282. We might have a day of no Obama. We're going to have an Obama-free day. We have the devil's sound from Europe, like he attacked the judge who blocked his amnesty. 
We can play that later. I can't even listen to him. I get ill. I have to reach for my niacin when I hear him talk now. And my magnesium aspartate in order to keep from melting down. I hear the devil's voice. I have to reach for both substances. And I have to light uh, a match. Make sure some sulfur goes into my nostrils every time he speaks. <clears throat> Let me take some of the calls. There's some great callers out there. KSFO Online, Line 7. Go ahead, you're on the Savage Nation. Yeah, hello, uh, Dr. Savage. I agree with you on uh, <clears throat> the correlation between uh, uh, creativity and uh, mental illness in general. Uh, that would include delusion as well as just uh, shifts away from reality. <clears throat> but I also think there's a correlation between very high IQ, a positive correlation, and mental illness also. Absolutely there is. And people with super high IQs have to be very careful uh, where they tread mentally. That's what I was getting at. Right. You know, because I have a theory for that, a hypothesis. When you have a very high IQ, you can, your imagination is expanded. And if you're not careful, your imagination can overwhelm you and you mix reality with what could be or what could be imagined. And the, the, the line blurs between what actually is and what you think it can be or what you can create. Absolutely. So let, let's make this very political. I have alleged, I have posited that Obama is mentally ill. I have said he is deranged in his assessment of what the reality is of the world in which he lives and the expectations he has as to how far he can push the world. Would you agree with me? What pushes the, what motivates this man to think he can override the people, the courts, and reality itself? What's his motivation? I think he's strictly sociopathic. As a, he's a clinical study in sociopathology. And that, that would, would also, uh, he's also mental, that is a mental illness. But I think he has uh, severe delusions of who he actually uh, is and what his powers are. Right. Now, where did he get that? Where did President Obama derive this delusional reality that he lives in? I'll tell you where, from my point of view. Here is a kid. Let's not forget he was biracial in Hawaii. And let's not forget that the, the skids were greased for him from early on. Everything was done for him. He never worked a day in his life. He went to a very expensive a high school in Hawaii, Punahou, at full scholarship, paid for by some very wealthy liberals who were cultivating him from early on to do, to become what he ha what he has become. This child was handpicked. It's almost like a, a a movie that I saw many years ago about a child who's handpicked to become a leader, and in so doing, he thinks that he actually is as smart as they told him he is, and then he becomes deluded with the thought that he's as powerful as he thinks he is, and he doesn't have any limits. He's never had limits. No one's ever stopped him before. You're exactly right. He was His mother gave him up to this group of people, to Frank Davis, who was an agent from Chicago, and then once the... This was being orchestrated and paid for by very, uh, very wealthy uh, Marxists, but wealthy Marxists in Chicago. They got him to Chicago afterwards, and then they, he basically incubated there and totally surrounded with compliments, with, with uh, special schooling, the Midwest Academy. And he's promoted and promoted with these huge invisible shadow government behind him, all the while nursing in his sick mind that I'm a genius, that I'm an Alexander the Great, that I'm all-powerful, omniscient. And you end up, with a, with a flawed individual, he was sick, even when, hey, genetically, I think he's a defect. But then, add that on, and then you get this, this monster we have today. He is a monster, and he's a monster. They're throwing gays off roofs in Iraq, and he does nothing against ISIS. Women, young girls are being kidnapped and raped and sold into slavery. He does nothing. And he gives a crazy speech from Europe. Did you hear it where he said, you have to hear the soundbite. He said, our policy is not yet firm in the Middle East. And Robert, do we have that mad statement by the president? It's utterly madness to listen to this. And you hear the, the deep. Here we go. Clip 10. You got to hear this one. Listen to this. When uh, a finalized plan is presented to me by the Pentagon, then I will share it with the American people. It's not uh, I, we don't yet have uh, a, uh, a complete strategy because it requires commitments on the part of the Iraqis as well uh, about how 
the recruitment takes place, how that training takes place. Can you imagine the leader of the most powerful military on earth saying he doesn't have a strategy in the Middle East and he's waiting on the Iraqi military? Can you imagine? Think. I want you to think about what he just said. We know that he got to Bavaria and drank a beer at 11 in the morning local time. We know that he was having a good time. Maybe he was drunk when he said this. He spoke off the cuff and said, we don't have a complete strategy. What does that strike you as? Is that obviously it's not a leadership statement. It's a delusion. This is a delusional man. Why would he tell the Air Force not to fire rockets at, uh, at the enemy itself unless he was on their side? This doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it's madness. I think there's something worse going on here. What do you think? I think that everything he says is a manipulation. There's not a sincere word that comes out of his mouth, and they're not his words. I think all the words, all, all the decisions he makes are predetermined by the same group that put him there, channeled through Valerie Jarrett as the conduit. And this is your brief today. Like an actor, given his lines, I think that's what Obama says. But, he's, but he probably still thinks he's the one in control. But he is being controlled. He's a puppet. So he's sort of the man, in your mind, the Manchurian candidate. Is that what you're saying? I'm ab- absolutely saying that. And nobody, I mean, nobody, you're the only one that I've ever heard that actually start. it, it touches on that and explores who is behind this guy. Nobody else gets behind or even wants to go behind the curtain. They show no interest. All the articles, even on the right and right publications, just concentrate on Obama and Obama and Obama. He's incompetent. He's a bumbler. You're one of the very, very few. And I think you were the original one who actually came out and said, I don't think so. I think he's accomplishing everything that he's setting out to do, and he's making it look like he's just mucking through. Yes, absolutely. That's how I see it. That's how I've seen it for a very long time right now. Can I ask you, uh, I mean, I'm just curious, listening to your voice, because I have the ability to put things together. What, what do you do professionally, if you can tell us? I retired as a mechanical engineer. So you know how things work. I, well, <laughs> you, you know how things work. In other words, how parts go together. It has to work. I am only interested in what works and what's real. Everything else is aesthetic. You know, it's- <laughs> I love it. I love engineers. They're very, very different people from from the type I know. Look, this was a great conversation, a great spinoff from the point of origin of uh, creativity and psychosis sharing a genetic source. And I segued it to Obama, who I think is, yes, by design, doing everything he was told to do before he was handpicked by the shadowy group that picked him and is right now shadowy picking the next president of the United States. They've already got that one picked. It's all lined up. We can pretty much tell you who the shadowy group is. You don't have to be a genius to put those people together. We know that one of them is George Soros, who is going to spend, he said, $9 million to sue states that have voting rights acts, meaning that prevent illegal aliens from voting, prevent people from double and triple voting, preventing people who shouldn't vote from voting. George Soros, one of the most evil men in the history of America, is spending $9 million to override states' rights. My friend... I'm glad that we talked, and I'm giving you uh, a novel written for you called Countdown to Mecca, a special gift for your retirement uh, and for Father's Day. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. The word that's used an awful lot, used as a noun, an adjective, used in medicine. Oh, he's insane. Oh, you're insane. But it's used almost in a fond way today. But true insanity is nothing uh, to be laughed at. It's uh, a horrible place to be, as you know, if you've been sick or if you've had people in your family who are mentally ill. It's not a laughing matter. And so it's a great topic for our times because I think that the whole society is insane. Personally, I sit here and I watch a a mentally ill society. The entire society is insane. Do I have to say Bruce Jenner again? They are lauding this man like he is a hero. Someone sent me a picture over the weekend. I thought it was going up on my website. It's from a military friend. 
and it shows four Iraqi vets, one of them covered in blood after a firefight. And they're holding this guy up. They're just dirty and full of blood with their weapons hanging from their shoulders. And it said, we're, we're on our way to celebrate Bruce Jenner's heroism. You know, I mean, there's a difference between a real hero and this insanity that we're talking about, promulgated by the psychosis called liberalism. Liberalism is a mental disorder. Make no mistake about it. I don't care how prevalent it is. I don't care how popular it is. I don't care how lauded it is. I don't care whether you're a liberal. Liberalism, at the end of the day, you'll find out, as sure as I'm sitting here, is a mental disorder. You'll come to understand it. You will come to understand it. And it's worth talking about because the country is dying in front of our eyes. So I'd rather go back to the topic in a more generic way of uh, mental, mental uh, uh, schizophrenia, I guess, and psychosis, creativity and psychosis, rather, because uh, schizophrenia and psychosis are not one and the same, by the way. But how many people ape being nuts, wild, far out, crazy, who are not that creative, but they act, they ape it, you know, like the artist type who has a gallery opening. We've seen it in popular culture and movies where the artist will put on a bizarre outfit or act, you know, crazy during the opening in order to make the buyers think that they're more creative than they are. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like put on the act. Oh, he's, she's a crazy artist. Well, okay, that's one way to go about selling your stuff, but there's another way, which is to not even be at the opening and let your agents, sell, <laughs> let your crazy agents sell the paintings, for example. Or show up in a uh, Brooks Brothers suit and be a total normopath and act like uh, a royal. Curtsy. You don't have to drink and be stupid. You don't have to sell a painting. Let the art sell itself. But everything is an act. You take a look at the talentless, the talentless Lady Gaga. Talentless, ugly woman. But she's a great performer. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. All right, turn off the schmaltz. Uh, I don't know where to take the show right now. You know, we're talking about mood disorders and creativity. I don't want to go into the political, but it certainly affects our politicians. I, I will stand by my allegation that a goodly percentage of our so-called leaders are insane. They're on, they're on medication, as sure as I'm sitting. It's what explains their behavior. It explains their lack of afference. It explains their in unwillingness to know what they're doing, to accept that they're violating the will of the people. I've also called for drug testing all members of Congress on a monthly basis. If you work for a corporation, you have to pee in a cup. It's true. It's a fact. Well, I would think that people who have access to our uh, most dear uh, security interests uh, should uh, pee in a cup so that we the people can see which one of them are unfit at any speed. And that includes the president. I think a president should be forced to take a drug test once a month. How do you like that? Now, of course, if we did that, there'd be no one running for office, I suppose. So we're going to have to live with these nuts for a long time. So talking about mood disorders and writers, poets, and artists is another story. And uh, we know the famous story of Ernest Hemingway, one of my early heroes, who I love. I mean, I revered this guy. This guy was Zeus to me. And when I read, finally read what I read in the news, that he shot his brains out with a shotgun after uh, electroconvulsive treatment or shock therapy. I blame the shock therapy, not him. I blame the Mayo Clinic to this day for killing Hemingway because I studied that, that suicide very carefully. You know what the, talking about Hemingway for a minute. Now, first of all, his father shot himself. Did you know that? I don't know if you know this. That's a sad truth that seems to run in families. Suicide tends to run in families. It's a terrible thing to say, but... Uh, unfortunately, there are genetic, you know, links here. So Hemingway is acting bizarre. He was a huge, a monstrous alcoholic. It severely affected his uh, moods and, and, and emotions. I mean, the man drank around the clock. And uh, it certainly affected his feelings of depression. The first thing a, a person who has such problems should do is give up alcohol immediately. Totally. Central nervous system depressant. And alcoholism? Are you kidding me? Forget about alcohol. It's a terrible drug for people who are like that. But nevertheless, get back to, to electroconvulsive therapy because it's, going, it's having a comeback right now. Shock therapy. A nightmare. So Hemingway's having these problems. The quacks talk him into going to uh, 
the Mayo Clinic, which I call the mayonnaise clinic because their medicine is like that of mayonnaise. It's uh, mayonnaise and white bread as far as I'm concerned. It's not a whole wheat treatment. They sent him to the Mayo Clinic. They put him, uh, they give him EKG, uh, sorry, electroconvulsive therapy. He loses the ability to think. He can't create, he can't think. His mind is shot. He walks out of the clinic on the way to the tarmac to the twin turbo plane that was going to take him back to Ketchum, Idaho. And he tried to walk into the propeller of the plane. And people stopped him. Well, shortly thereafter, he got home and, you know, did what he did, shot his brains out. I think it's because he couldn't use his mind anymore and he was useless. He didn't want to live anymore. I mean, famous stories like that lead you to ask questions about how could we have saved such a person? Or the famous story of Virginia Woolf who drowned herself when she felt a depressive episode coming on and she couldn't control it. Or composer Robert Schumann who died in a mental institution. We even know about the Michelangelo was, I believe, mentally off, right? And there have been studies done on this issue. And uh, another study was done with a million people conducted at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And of course, they found a number of correlations between creative occupations and mental illnesses. For example, not so surprisingly, writers had a higher risk of anxiety and bipolar disorders, schizophrenia, unipolar depression, and substance abuse. And were, were almost twice as likely as the general population to kill themselves. Dancers and photographers were also more likely to have bipolar disorder. So knowing that is one thing, but helping people is another, especially if you are suffering. You know, you have a close relative with such a disorder. And you have to understand that there's, there are many ways to control these illnesses other than drugs, other than drugs. And I think people are becoming aware of those other methods, whether they be exercise or yoga, which is a form of exercise and meditation. Uh, and certainly vitamin therapy should not be ignored, especially if you're educated and can research some of this on your own. And you'll have people who tell you they couldn't believe the results of taking massive doses of niacin on their, uh, on their formerly uncontrollable emotions. They couldn't believe it. Or some people have reported remarkable, remarkable changes in their view of the world uh, by taking magnesium in the newer forms. You read this in the literature now. So things are emerging in this area that are worth looking at. And the mood creativity research should not exclude these outside uh, influences. Because, see, here's the thing. I think a lot of creative people feel that in, if they kill those edgy moods, they're going to kill their creativity. The opposite may be true. I study this in, to, to a great, great extent. I don't mean as a psychiatrist. I mean as an interested outside observer who's trained in science. And what I came to conclude was is that the greatest artists were the hardest workers. And the greatest artists were the most disciplined. And the greatest artists were the least nuts, as far as I can tell. In other words, yeah, they could have these emotions, they could have these feelings, but as you, the average person who's not that creative, let's say, you also, what are you, you don't have the human, you're not in the human condition? Of course you have impulses. Or as a rabbi once said to me, he said, do you think I'm made of stone? In other words, he has emotions and feelings, but he suppresses them. And that leads us to the whole issue of repression and suppression. A little known thing called repression and suppression of urges. Something that's anathema to modern America. In the Spock age, if it feels good, do it. Johnny's smearing the walls with feces, being told he's Picasso, etc. I think there may be a place in our society for repressing emotions and suppressing feelings. That's my feeling on this issue. I think maybe we should move on with a few more calls and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take them. You know, KBET Radio, line three, you're up. Go ahead and make your point. You're on the Savage Nation. Uh, yes. Um, I believe everybody ought to be tested for mental health. Uh, I believe everybody is insane or mad, as in Alice in Wonderland. Everybody's mad in Wonderland. And everybody needs to be tested, I feel, to find out if they're criminally insane, if they're dangerous, or if they're harmless. And I believe that's, that's important. My foundation is the Song of Moses, Chapter 32, Deuteronomy. I believe that is just how I feel about it, Michael. Well, wait, let me see if I can back this up. Who's going to do the testing and who's going to establish the norm of what insanity is? 
That's a good question. I'm, are you going to let the government do it? You're going to let the nuts who run this government determine who's sane? Michael, I believe those. I believe there are people. Everyone's insane, and we have those in government that are criminally insane. <laughs> that well, that I can applaud for sure. You know, it leads to a lighter moment. Uh, what's your first name? I don't have it up here. My given name is Ronald. I'm an actor in the union. My my union name is Roland. Well, Ronald or Roland. I remember my father laughing when he would read the newspaper when I was a kid. And one of the things he read was, I think it was in the New York Daily News. I was a little kid and he laughed. He chuckled. I said, what are you laughing at, Dad? He said, a, a psychiatrist just said that 95% of the people who live in Manhattan are neurotic or have some kind of mental illness. And he laughed. He said, I would think it's closer to 100% given what he's seen in Manhattan at those days. So what you're saying is everyone's nuts. Yes, are, uh, on one side or the other. Are, you, are they dangerously nuts or are they harmlessly nuts? Well, we've touched on it with the president. I think he's a dangerous nut. Uh, his actions seem to prove that. And I would say that Congress, I would say Boehner and McConnell are very dangerous men. They have no idea what they're doing, or do they know what they're doing? Of course they know what they're doing. They're paid stooges of the structure that put him in power, that wants everything that the New World Order demands done now before Obama leaves office. They are dying with fear that a true Republican conservative might actually take the office. They're terrified that all of their hard work to establish America as one broken egg in the New World Order omelet will be undone unless it's taken care of in the next few months. You got a point, honestly. Thomas Jefferson said the same thing, and they don't listen to him. What, they're not going to listen to me either. All right, my friend, I'm sending you a copy of Countdown to Mecca for schizos and non-schizos. Uh, alike. Let's go to line nine, WMAL in Washington on the issue of mental illness. Go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. Good evening, Dr. Savage. Um, I, at the age of 49, because of procrastination due to fear, which is, I feel fear for some people is a mental illness. I know it is for me. I'm not sure what it's connected to, what type of psychosis, what. Uh, as a result of just uh, situation in my past, um, which is kind of a checkered past situation. Nothing I did, but at a young age, I was placed in an institution. And um, <coughs> I'd like to add to what you said, there are other answers besides drugs and institutionalization. Um, Absolutely. And, and what, wait, what, before you go, what have you found in your life that controls these, these let's say, these, these fears you have? Is there anything other than drugs? Well, I can tell you, I can tell you right now that I've had my experiences with illicit drugs. I, after being in the system and seeing what I saw, um, I, I don't agree with drug use in any type of pharmacological way. I'm totally against that. I saw things that I could write a book about. I'm not a writer, though. I'm a musician, Mike. And I just have to tell you that at 49, you know, I'm finally coming into my own. I've had a lot of experiences and... Um, you know, but what do you use? What do you use to control your fear when you feel feel fear coming on? Well, here's the thing. I'm I've been afraid to do what I'm good at, Mike, and I'm very good at what I do. I hate to say that. It sounds conceited. Well, wait, hold on. You're afraid to do what you do for fear of failing or fear of succeeding? Fear fear of both. It's yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting statement because one would have been easier to discuss than another. Because the logical, the logical point of departure in that question was you were just as frightened of succeeding as you were of failing. So which prevails? Oh, here's the thing. I, what I did, I, all I can tell you is what I did to get over this. I started going down into Georgetown in D.C. and playing on the streets with my amps. I had one of those car battery chargers. and I, the amps I love it. I, I've, saw, I've seen some of those musicians in New Orleans. They're so talented, some of them astoundingly great talented uh, great talent i've seen it in the street all my life in real cities you don't see it in san francisco where there's almost no art whatsoever san francisco is a mock city it's a mock bohemian city it makes believe it's new orleans when it's lost its bohemian edge about 50 years ago but uh, okay so you started performing in the street and what happened well i had everybody putting money in my box from who i would call asian ladies mama san to people from the middle east to people from so uh, there's on any given night there are tens of thousands of people in Georgetown, Mike. It's magical, and the pol and when I had, you know, police go by and give me thumbs up, 
you know. Any, I, I'm trying not to crack up, but I want you to know it's it's tears. Of- what are you saying? You're saying that the love from the people gave you the courage to continue? Yes, they felt what, what I consider. And what you're saying is your ability to touch humanity through your music in the street gave you a new love for humanity and, and it helped allay your fear, right? Yes, sir. And I've worked very hard. And you're right. You get nowhere without the work, but you've got to have the natural talent, too. I've- yes, that's right. You have to have the natural talent, but you just have the guts to, to work through it, what you just said to me. Yes, and it's... N- n'importe où de os de monde. I mean, it's unbelievable to me, anywhere out of this world. Uh, very interesting call, and I appreciate it. I would send you Countdown to Mecca if you want it, so stay on the line. I need a lot of thought about that one. I have to think about what he just said and how it worked for him. But when he said Asian ladies and Middle Easterners and all, wasn't he saying something bigger than you thought? He was saying he connected with humanity. He didn't feel isolated. He didn't feel alone. He touched. He reached out and touched humanity, and humanity said, you're okay. Isn't that what we just heard? That's something that most creative people need to remember. And it's a danger that all of us who work on our own have to remember, which is isolation can produce some of the most frighteningly dangerous situations for those of us in the creative professions. Unfortunately, uh, if you're in a creative profession, you cannot go to a commune and paint. You can't go to a commune and, and write while talking to other people, nor can you go to a talk radio commune and be on the microphone with others smiling at you. It's a very, very long distance ride on your own. And either you have the guts for it or you don't, and either you're willing to take that ride or you're not. But I don't think it's limited to to these professions. I mean, a pilot who flies a plane across the country alone, what's he doing? Uh, You think of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry and and his writings and things like that. So many professions are conducted alone, and people have to learn not to be afraid of their own thoughts. That's a whole different story. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. We're about to sue you out right now. This is uh, second hour is coming to an end. I got so many things I want to say. And, you know, I started this topic quite by chance. And as usual, we've got some of the most interesting calls in the world. And someone sent this by email. We're talking about psychological testing of Congress. Someone wrote this. How about pre-employment psychological testing for Congress, similar to that in which many high-level executives must participate, not to mention law enforcement from patrol to administration and even firefighters in many cities? Lawmakers don't need to go through testing, only cops. Do you understand what what we're saying here? It's an amazing story. It's long overdue that our Congress was not only forced to pee in a cup to see what drugs they're on, but to go through pre-employment psychological testing because many of their actions are the actions of insane people. Who would leave a border open in a time of international terror but an insane Congress? Who but an insane president would tell us that all immigrants come here to work and they're all so wonderful. Take a look at what happened in Finland when they stopped Muslim immigration. Their crime went down over 50%. Rapes, murders, robbery. This is in liberal Finland. They slammed the door on Muslim immigrants. Check it out. See if I'm making it up. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. You listen to these great songs, whether they are of the past or the present, 
the great lyrics, and you say, how do people come up with such lyrics? How in the world can they be so creative to have images like this, a horse with no name? And although no one was there, there were many sounds. And where do they get this from? Well, that's the artist for you. That's the whole point about being an artist is they see things and hear things, smell things, sense things that the rest of us don't see, hear, smell, or taste. Now, at a certain point, those sensations can overwhelm the individual and they become overwhelmed by them and they become mentally unstable. And that's uh, what we're talking about, the tortured artist, the universal nature of the tortoise, the tortured artist, psychosis and creativity. And do you need to be nuts, in other words, to be creative? The answer is, of course not. And Huxley, I think, wrote it. It was Aldous Huxley, one of my great heroes, another one of the great heroes of my life. I think it was his book where I have it right here. I swear to God, I think I have it in my hand in a minute. It was on his mescaline trips, which I've never used, by the way. I hate psychedelic drugs. I hate them with a passion. I think they're the most dangerous thing that we're ever introduced to Western society. Yeah, maybe they work in, in, uh, in primitive cultures. They have no place in a technological society because they will drive you mad here. The Doors of Perception in Heaven and Hell by Aldous Huxley, a little paperback I've had for years. And I think that in one of his essays, I believe it was Aldous Huxley, I could be mistaken, who wrote, people have always asked uh, about creativity and madness. And are all creative people mad? And he said... I believe he said that creative people create in spite of their madness, not because of it. Creative people are creative in spite of their neurosis, not because of the neurosis. It was one of the most liberating statements I ever read when I was younger. Because when you're younger, you don't know anything. This is the beauty of age, is that you know a lot of things because you've had a chance to live through them and see others and analyze and such. But many young people are, have the false assumption through their peers that in order to be creative, and they must be edgy, and they keep pushing themselves to be more edgy and more edgy and more edgy, and often they drive themselves crazy and don't produce very much. And they should remember that, that one statement, which is that creative people don't create because of these uh, feelings, but in spite of them. And once you, once you recognize what that means, it'll give you the power to still feel those things and create in spite of them and not let them rule you. I thought that was great. I forget who wrote it. It was probably Huxley. But I thought I would share that with my audience because I don't know how we got into this anyway, but this is the kind of topic I like the best. This is where I'm at my best, incidentally. If you notice the slight shift in my show over the last few days, it's more Michael Savage than it is, let's say it's more, more of me than it's ever been for a long time. When I began in radio, it wasn't all politics. It never was. Many days it would be just simply what was on my mind with a little news. Then as time wore on, it became almost all news and nothing else, and it became boring for me, horribly boring. And I think that's what's going on in the medium right now. I cannot simply do the news. You want the news, you go to the Drudge Report or a few other sites, that's the end of it. What do you need me for, to, re to read the headlines? You can read them yourself in about three minutes. I went to dinner with a friend over the weekend who was a... Uh, I would say still a very liberal lawyer. I grew up with him in college, and he lives near me. We never, t we don't talk to each other for a number of reasons. We don't hate each other. We have nothing in common. So I thought, but we we got back together as time went on. We're both older, and as I say, uh, you don't make new old friends. He knew my parents when they were alive. I knew his parents when they were alive. To me, that's worth something. So we go to dinner, and he says, "Michael, tell your audience that I was duped by Obama." As a, as, a, as a liberal, he said, please tell them I was duped by Obama. So I looked at him, I said, and what, you're going to be duped by Hillary now? He said, oh, no, 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 she's horrible. She's disgusting. She's toxic. I thought that was an interesting statement. I think a lot of people are changing right now, politically and in and, and many other ways. Society is going through an evolution right now. And I think the evolution we're going through is almost a shocking evolution in front of our eyes, despite whether you believe in poll, uh, whether you believe in polls or not is irrelevant. This is almost like Velikovsky's earth and upheaval, what's going on in our society. It's almost on the level of worlds in collision, what's going on in our society right now. Forget the reasons. It doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter the why and how of it doesn't matter. But unless you recognize that there's a seismic shift going on in our society in many directions at once, and I don't know where this is going to end up. The liberals would have you believe that we're moving rapidly to the left. I don't believe that's true. I believe that at the outset of this 
earthquake. We're moving, people are moving in that direction. Gay marriage and this and that, you know, obsession with this, this Bruce moron, like he's the God Almighty and a great hero. It's sickening. Now, Man With No Penis is going to be on the Learning Channel. TLC used to be the Learning Channel. Now it's the Liberal Channel, TLC. How that's, how's a Learning Channel, Man With No Penis? I'm giving an example of madness. But I don't think that the earthquake is necessarily going to end up with a, uh, uh, a new earth that's more liberal. I think it's going to end up with a new earth that's more conservative, incidentally. Because once people come to understand what this extreme acceptance or tolerance has led to, which most adults see, they're going to come to understand how dangerous the world is that they've created through their tolerance or acceptance. And I, I've been trying to preach this for years. You think I'm a mean guy? You think I don't know what it is to be, let us say, uh, a liberal? I was a liberal when I was young. I didn't know any better. And then when I got bitten by it in many different ways, I slowly evolved to be who I am many, many, many years ago. And people say, well, hey, you're, you're a phony. What do you mean I'm a phony? People don't evolve? I mean, if you're still the same at 50 that you were at 20, what does that make you? It makes you a, an idiot. I mean, you're frozen. You haven't evolved. What are you? You're an unevolved child. Everyone evolves if they're, if they're flexible and their minds are open. But if you don't evolve and you want to ape a 20-year-old when you're 60, then I pity you. That's all. That's how I look at things. That's my, my worldview. So th this whole topic of creativity and psychosis has provoked a lot of discussion of the, of the kind of discussion I like. And I think it's the third show in a series that I've done. And it's all after my bout with the flu. <laughs> I've noticed this change in myself since I had this severe, this, this virus did something to me. I don't know what it was. It probably cleaned out my brain or something or the antibiotics and the mega doses of nutrients that I put, my on, put myself on have changed or clarified my feelings and my, and my, my thinking in so many different ways. And it's encouraged me really to dare to take the risk of going into areas such as this instead of the same old uh, stuff that you're going to hear all day long. I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do the other stuff. Hillary and corruption. And the, I mean, you can read all of it. We know what she is. They're absolute villains. They're villainous, her and her husband. And then what? Why aren't they arrested for, for stealing the money and running it through like a, like, a, like a laundry? Why? Why? I don't know why. Because they own the government. Why? Because they bought off the congressman. They bought off the FBI. What do I know who they bought off? If they smeared leaders of the world, why wouldn't they smear the FBI? What do you, everything's owned. So... Why should I talk about it? Anyhow, I want to go back to these topics here and talk about creativity and psychosis and things of that nature. And let's go to WDRC Radio where an institution, a man from an institution is calling us. I don't know the individual's name. Line four, go ahead, please. What's your name? Robert. And Robert, are you institutionalized right now? Not at the present time, sir. Okay, so what, what motivated the call? I'm disgusted the way the system is run. What's happened to me, I've done nothing all my life, and I believe that there's an onset of this disease. I believe that it's a lack of discipline. And we're not being able to discipline our children. Do you think that that's what accounts for your being hospitalized? Yes, I do, sir. Why, because you were not disciplined, Robert? Because I was what? You were not disciplined as a child, is that what you're saying? I was first institutionalized at around the age of 18. Well, what did you do? What had you done? I used to smoke marijuana, sir, and I heard you speak about marijuana. And I it's one of them. It's probably the most dangerous of all drugs because it's being presented by Hollywood as a rather benign weed. In many individuals, it provokes, it provokes overt schizophrenia. You got that exactly right, sir. Exactly right. I know that for a fact. It provokes overt schizophrenia in susceptible individuals. In that sense, it is to be feared. It is a very dangerous drug. Thank you for the call, Robert. I don't want to dwell on that anymore and make you feel in any way upset. So we'll move on. He's saying marijuana basically put him into the into the institution. I agree with it. WBOB Radio, here's a beautiful call coming up on line six. Go ahead, please. What's your name? George. What's on your mind, George? Yes, George. Uh, my name is George. I've, my mother worked for a sig pen who wrote Three Faces of Eve, and she typed the manuscript. I sat in his office, read Psychiatric Journal. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. I know the book three. Uh, who wrote it? Thigpen, Dr. Thigpen, Augusta, Georgia. 
Okay, so what, what's your main point? My, that is why I've been interested, interested all my life in psychiatry. And in doing extensive reading and working with electronics um, in multiple places around the world, I found that uh, one of the most important people uh, with respect to what's happening in Congress in the world was, was uh, a doctor who worked for, for uh, Stalin, uh, and Pavlov. And pa- this is about the 100th anniversary of his major work where he won the Nobel Prize. You're talking about the Pavlov that we all know in terms of the Pavlovian reaction? Yes. And most people know that, that, but that's been going on for thousands of years where, where uh, people have given treats to dogs and then they react more in the way that you want them to react. But he also found that certain frequencies, like shock therapy, can induce all kinds of psychiatric problems. And after he found that, he found that some frequencies at extremely low power would help uh, kill pathogens in the body and help people. And we're in a situation here... Well, slow down. You're giving a lot of information. Yeah. For example, magnetism is used in uh, treating illnesses, and there's current evidence that magnetism does work in some cases. It's not all crazy stuff. I get it. I lived in Egypt, and they have resonance rooms there along the Nile, and Malta also has resonance rooms. Those are good frequencies. Uh, some of your major composers uh, of, of three or 400 years ago, Beethoven and others, knew about some of these frequencies. And... And Pavlov kind of knew about these frequencies, and he did extensive work before the Soviets took over Russia and after. And he told uh, Stalin, uh, stop killing people. I can control them. You don't have to kill them. He's the only person in the world that went up against Stalin, and Stalin said, okay, you'll live. Uh, your work is too important. Are you tell- I know where you're going here. Are you saying that the government is controlling individuals with frequencies now? I put in the computers overseas that do it. I'm not arguing with you. I'm listening. Are you suggesting that there are sound waves being generated in this country to control the population? Yes, and they come in different forms. They can be iPods, smart meters, radio waves. Uh, The most effective are quantum wave, where you vibrate um, uh, neutrinos. Neutrinos come at us from all different parts of the universe, and you can vibrate them, and that that type of waveform moves extremely fast. The Chinese, the Chinese are getting into researching it now. The Russians sold this technology to, to the Iranians. Okay, wait, this is, this is great stuff. We could talk for hours on this. So let's say we have an individual who senses that this is true. What can they do to block the, these waves? Well, it's pretty hard to block the quantum waves. The other waves can be blocked. You can, you can not spend so much time on an iPod, uh, uh, force your city, county to get rid of the, the smart meters and go to uh, a better type of meter that has uh, better frequencies on it. Uh, don't spend so much time on computers. Uh, just don't overload yourself with the radio. <laughs> I'm in front of a screen 18 hours a day lately, from morning till night, then to television. So, uh, But I love, I'm going to give you an example. I love being near the water, whether it be San Francisco Bay or on a, however, on the water, next to the water. I find, doesn't water absorb many of these uh, waves? Absolutely. Uh, water will absorb the waves and different uh, other substances, and there is treatment, and it's been highly controversial, um, and people like Dingle and, and others in Congress have worked to try to keep that, that medical equipment out of the United States. About 20,000 doctors worldwide have that equipment, which undoes the damage, and I have one. I grandfathered in. I'm a chemical engineer with a minor in pharmacy, kind of a pre-med degree. And I picked up some extremely nasty stuff over in the Middle East. As you remember, uh, Caligula, um, Alexander, Caesar, and Muhammad all had seizures. And they had seizures. Well, let's pause right here because I'm fascinated in listening to you. It's rather discursive in the sense that there's no form of structure to what you're saying other than the idea that waves are being generated by machinery to, to control the population. I'd rather just listen to your mind flow. I'll be right back to do so right here on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Hey, Savage. All right, this is a great conversation. Let's go back, caller, uh, on line six from B.O.B. Radio, I believe, in 
Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, he is suggesting that some insanity on the planet is controlled by waves, in some cases waves generated by governments. WBOB Radio, go ahead, please. So what were you saying, uh, sir? Yes, yes, Michael. Um, and, and, and it's not all waves that are out there, and it's not intentional on everybody's part who has radio stations or, or they have some type of electronic equipment, but specifically based on Pavlov's technology and people who came after him, there are specific ways that can that can create um, paranoia. Uh, Manchurian Candidates, and there are two movies about Manchurian Candidates. One with Frank Sinatra, and in both cases it was a torture type thing. But the Russians didn't really need to use torture as they developed um, the technique of which frequencies to use uh, to turn someone to a Manchurian Candidate. Uh, bad drugs uh, uh, in, uh, accelerate the process, and bad. Diseases. Right, but let's boil it down. You say you work with such... We only have 30 seconds, which is a shame. I said to you, living next to the water can block some of these waves. You agreed with that. What other practical matters can people use to control what enters their brain? Uh, just reduce the amount of ra radiological waves coming in, in their house, in, the, in their brain, and uh, take a break, you know, get away from it for a while. In other words, don't listen to talk radio, in other words. <laughs> I mean, I'm affecting their brain waves with my voice, am I not? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Some of the greatest art is visionary. Visionary art. And you want to talk about religion and vision, religion and visionary art, and how it changed through time and how the... Uh, the Catholics saw it differently than the Protestants. And you may not understand this, and people may find this shocking. Do you know that in Islam, where mosques have no images because it's prohibited by their religion, even in these mosques, there are some in the world which have uh, diamonds that are in these churches, in, in, in these mosques, dangling. These ornaments are amongst the very few vision-inducing devices permitted in Islam. As I said, mosques have no images. But sometimes in the Near East, the austerity of the mosque is sometimes mitigated by the transporting glitter of Rococo crystal. That's something you may not know, but it's, it's a little side, side issue. Stained glass, why was stained glass put into churches? Stained glass was installed for a reason. It was to create a vision. To people would look up from their books and see a vision of another world or other worlds. They're visionary stained glass. And then what happened was the Reformation occurred. And the Protestants disapproved the visionary experience and attributed a magical virtue to the printed word. And they put in clear windows. And churches with clear windows, the readers could look at their Bibles and prayer books and not be attempted to escape from the sermon into the visionary other worlds. The, see, this is all con connected to what we're talking about. Or does, uh, <coughs> Let's talk about madness and genius, creativity and psychosis. You know that famous picture, The Scream? You ever see the one, The Scream, by the celebrated Norwegian artist Edward Munch? You know, you'd know, if you saw the picture, you'd know it's of a man screaming with his hands next to his, his ears. And he was a celebrated Norwegian artist, Edward Munch. He died 70 years ago. And he created this masterpiece, The Scream. And it came to him in a vision as he stood on the edges of a fjord. And he said, the sun began to set. Suddenly the sky turned blood red. I stood there trembling with anxiety. And I sensed an endless scream passing through nature. So what is that? Well, people said that that represents the angst of modern man. That he felt as an artist. And he said, my fear of life is necessary to me, as is my illness. They are indistinguishable from me, and their destruction would destroy my art. Now, today, the medical profession is a little too quick, in my opinion, to suppress all such feelings with medication, and in so doing, quenching creativity across the planet, literally putting out the light of creativity with medication, as I'm talking to you. And if you think they're doing the patient a favor, you're mistaken. It's not always to the benefit of the patient to suppress 
the vision, incidentally. So let's go to the callers. And I don't know if you even want to talk much more about this. I don't know how I got into this, but I can't get out of it. Help me. I am trapped in an interesting discussion on talk radio. And I intend to stay here because I'm enjoying it. And we're not going to have Obama in this hour. There's going to be no uh, sound bites from the madman giving us his opinion on things from the G7 summit, sounding like a, a lunatic. So I, I, you can't believe it. I, I'm going to stay away from it. I need a day without him. I need a day without him. So let's take some callers. K-A-H-I. K-A-H-I Radio, line two. What's your point? Go ahead, please. Hey, this is Lori, and I. this is a great conversation. I'm loving it. I'm a practicing artist, 37 years in the field. I make my living at it, and I mentor a lot of young people coming into the field, and I get really tired of the sense of entitlement they come into with. I went to art school, so I'm going to be discovered, and I don't have to pay my dues. <laughs> I get it. Amazing. You know, and I, I've stopped mentoring the ones like that. There are some young people. You mean you mean spoiled brats who think that the world owes them a living in plain English? Yes, I've got two college age kids. It's absolutely nuts, and you know, I wouldn't be where I am without the blessing of my husband and his support. But these little well, but let's stick to skits. Let's stick to creativity and psychosis for a moment. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Uh, I think a lot of it's BS. I think it's very easy for someone to say, uh, my mother-in-law had manic depression. I think it's very easy to say that, well, you've got this condition, so you're going to take these pills and it's going to make you better. It did not help her one bit. It did but sticking not. to art, the famous American artist Jackson Pollock suffered from alcoholism and depression. He had inner turmoil every day of his life. And his canvases reflected this inner mad, this inner turmoil, didn't it? Oh, definitely. Most definitely. Right. So in other words, what I'm saying is if he were alive today and he went to a shrink in Manhattan, the shrink would have put him on an antidepressive and would have suppressed his madness, so to speak, his turmoil, and he wouldn't have made the great Jackson Pollock paintings that we know. I agree with you on that. I do agree with you on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what's the, so what's the bottom line of this discussion? Is the world a better place because of Jackson Pollock's paintings? Uh, or should he have, this poor man have had his suffering diminished through medication? I don't think the medication helps the suffering, so that's kind of a moot point in my... Very good. Oh, I love your answer. Yes, I, if, it, if it was a magic bullet that necessarily cured the suffering, I don't, I don't think we would be having this discussion. But there have been too many suicides on these medications for me to believe that they're as useful as the medical pharmaceutical establishment would have us believe they are. Oh, I agree. They, they don't make patients. They make money. They don't care. Well, my artist friend, I'm sending you my novel, Countdown to Mecca. I realize it's not as good as Hemingway, but I would say that the, the, the descriptions in my novel of San Francisco are as good of, as any ever written in any novel that I've ever read, and I've read a lot of novels. And I really don't need a newspaper to tell me what I know for, to be a, a fact myself. My descriptions of the bay and the streets and, you know, as background for, for what goes on in this city of ours are, are as good as any ever written. And I'm very proud of that. And I like the clown and I like the hooker. By the way, did anyone ever see the Humphrey Bogart movie, Dark Passage? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking. If you're a film noir lover, as I am. Do you remember the 1947 movie with Humphrey Bogart and Laura Bacall? I think it was for her first starring role. She was 22 years old. And they both, uh, uh, he lives, it's about a man falsely accused of killing his wife. And he comes out, he wants to clear his name. So he goes and has surgery, if you remember the movie. And he appears in bandages, his face is in bandages before he's actually introduced to the, to the audience. It's very clever how they did it, because if they had introduced him before the, the surgery, he'd be the same man after. But you didn't see his face till after the bandages were removed. Anyway, the, 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 the movie largely takes place in her apartment, which is in the Moloch building on Telegraph Hill on Montgomery Street. I think it's 1360 Montgomery. It was a great Art Deco building. It still is. It's a little run down now. I almost bought an apartment there 20 years ago, but like everything else, I almost didn't. Yeah, it only went up about 50 times. <laughs> but nevertheless, the Moloch building is where it took place, and it's next to the Filbert Street steps in San Francisco, which are wooden steps which run all the way down Telegraph Hill, down to Battery Street, okay? 
And these steps go through gardens and little wooden houses dating back to the, to the gold rush era. So there's a very famous scene in, in a Dark Passage that I saw years ago. How many of you have read Countdown to Mecca and found that scene in my book? Because I used the Moloch building for the locale where the clown Sammy and the hooker Anastasia live. And then I used the Filbert Street steps for a chase scene where the CIA is chasing uh, uh, the heroes down those steps. And they, they, it's amazing. It's well done. And I envision this book eventually becoming a film and it's being redone and reshot today. I think it'll be a very exciting scene in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the filmic world, Countdown to Mecca, if ever there's a filmmaker who wants to make it and there's the budget to do so. KKO, KK. O-H Radio, KKOH in Reno. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Michael, Dark Passage was on just the other night, so I did see it. I'm about yes, it was on Friday night. That's when I saw it again. I can't believe it. As did I. Now, I'm a third of the way through uh, Countdown to Mecca. Are you referring to your scene in the beginning when the CIA agents, like in the first three, pass, uh, three chapters, that chase? No, I don't think that it's there. I, I don't remember, actually. I'm sorry to tell you. I haven't reread my book in a while, but isn't it toward the end that they're running down onto the Embarcadero and one of them gets hit by a trolley car? That's right. Yep. Yeah, I love that. I love those old trolley cars on the Embarcadero and how in one of the chase scenes, one of the men tries to kill Anastasia and she loses a shoe and she's running across uh, the Embarcadero and he's about to shoot her when he loses... His, his sense of where he is, and one of the trolley cars hits him and kills him. It's a nice scene. Too much. <laughs> it's, a nice, it's a nice scene. It would make for a very good scene in a movie, yeah. I guarantee you. So you're, you're, what, are you, what, what are we calling about today, my friend? What are you calling about? Friend, uh, you and I have spoken before. We, we talk about your dreams. Anyway, I'm a psychologist, but here's the thing. Oh, <laughs> you're the famous radio psychologist who interprets the white owl for me in other dreams. Well, no, I'm not the white owl one. I'm the other one. Uh, I talked to you about your children, et cetera, et cetera. But this was quite a while ago. So we, there are a few of us out here. <laughs> well, uh, today is a very warm day. We have a high pressure zone sitting over San Francisco. Temperatures are going to be in the hundreds and inland and probably closer to the 80s in San Francisco. And the bay is calm. And right after the radio show, I'm going to jump on a ferry to inhale the salt air. And I didn't dream that I'm going to do it. Well, very therapeutic. It is, because I want to absorb those dangerous waves that are being uh, 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 dis dissipated, uh, disseminated, rather, by the Obama administration. <laughs> Let's not even bring him up. But, Michael, seriously, I want to share something with you. I suffered with unipolar depression since a young age. Hold on. What is unipolar as opposed to bipolar? As opposed to bipolar. Right. So unipolar meaning depression. No elation. Oh, you were down. You were down all the time. That's very sad. You're in my office. I'm looking at it right now to give you a little kick. But I wait, wait, ho, ho, ho. What are you looking at right now? I've got it right here, and it's uh, a copy I made. Obviously, I, I laminated it, and I wait, wait, ma'am. You a copy of what? I'm losing it. Mate, you're not hearing me. A copy of what? Oh, the scream. The scream picture. Oh, the painting I mentioned a few minutes ago. <laughs> But mine is a woman screaming. And who painted it? I have no idea. I copied it out of a magazine many years ago. I laminated it. So how did you get out of your unipolar depression? Okay. Listen to how. Number one, I was threatened with uh, ECT because there was nothing else going to help me after years of therapy. I was mm -hmm. so scared it jolted me out of it. And not only did it jolt me out of it, I then came back to understanding that faith, faith in God, faith in the universe, faith in a higher power was the only thing that was going to cure me. And that was probably five years ago. And I'm okay today. Wait, hold on now. This is very important. You were so afraid of electroshock therapy that you found God, in essence. Side effects. As I pondered and, you know, perused articles on what the side effects were, it scared the hell out of me. And I said, I can't do this. I got too much going on in my life, uh, even though I was depressed. Did you, did you have children at the time? Something in my brain. Ma'am, did you have children at the time? No, I don't have children. I'm divorced. I don't have children. I ask for a very important reason, but go on. Please continue. 
Sure. So after after that, I began studying. I will say uh, with a rabbi because I am Jewish, and uh, in the last five years, I have been just fine. Not only that, I have uh, built a business. And, uh, in fact, you and I have talked about it. I won't So what that. you're saying to the audience at large is that you can escape mental illness with different methods, and methods different than drugs in some cases. Isn't that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. And I want to tell you the other techniques I used with depressed, I use right now with depressed children, other than any drugs, I use... Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, I teach them this. I teach them something called tapping, also emotional freedom technique is the, uh, is the name of it. It's called tapping. I use guided imagery, and we do what you do, Michael, journaling. But do you do massive doses of B vitamins in any case? Yes, the orthomolecular therapy is... Oh, thank God you didn't say no. I never heard of it. I'm so glad you said orthomolecular therapy because I don't know how people can't understand how therapeutic the B vitamins can be. Not only those. How about, the, how about all the amino acids, Michael? Now, how, uh, have you tried magnesium in any of the children? Uh, not with the, I got to tell you something. I can only recommend, I cannot prescribe, so all I can do is recommend, and I find that people are so highly resistant. They would rather go to a psychiatrist. Yeah, and they'd rather go to a psychiatrist and put the child on a major league antidepressive than trust you. I don't know that it's a matter of trust, it's a matter of choice, but... Well, it's easier, it's simpler for them. The mother doesn't have to think. She doesn't want to know that maybe by taking her little beautiful daughter to Starbucks for a, for a donut, uh, excuse me, for, a, for a, a frappuccino at uh, 7 in the morning, she's actually inducing uh, some of these problems. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. So I'm going to read a few pieces from Mecca. Uh, one of my new characters is a nutty professor by the name of Peter, Bernie Peters. And he's based on someone I actually know. And I said, Professor Bernie Peters is a bona fide genius, Jack, Jack told Doc. And he said, I know that name. I can't place it. Former childhood prodigy, finished his dissertation at 18, worked in the nuclear weapons industry for more than 40 years. Peters lived in a small rustic log cabin tucked into a corner of the preserve. But he wasn't there when Jack and Doc arrived in the minivan. Jack acted as if it were business as usual. So they're looking for him out on the beach. And here's a guy who worked on the W-53 Titan II warhead knows everything about physics and knows about politics, works for the CIA, and they said that he's a little loony. And Doc, Doc says, well, how so? Well, he believes in UFOs. He writes long papers about mind travel. He likes to roam the wild peninsula, communing with the deer and the trees. Jack stopped and pointed. The subject of their conversation was sitting on a rock formation marked by a red furry algae. Doc took his first look at Professor Peters. Good day, Professor, Jack said. Trentophilia was the first thing he said as the two approached. He pointed at the rocks. Spores of this algae cause blood rain in Kerala. That's in Countdown to Mecca. In case you don't know what I'm capable of, read it. 